Welcome everyone to the DataFam Community Jam episode number nine. I'll go ahead and get started because I want to respect your time. So my name is Emily Kuhnd and I'm the founder of the Tableau Fringe Festival. And together with Tableau, we have brought you these series of data jams. And we are so excited. And you know, these events aren't possible without the organizing team who's made up of Sarah Bartlett, Lorna Brown, Kevin Flairledge, um, Alex Walchek, and of course, Jordan Scott from Tableau. So I want to give them a huge thanks for helping organize this event, because without them and our speakers, this event wouldn't be possible. And I am so excited that we have guests from all over the world today. We've got folks from Cape Town and Paris and right up the street in Maryland. So before we dig into today's content, which we have a stellar lineup for you all, um, I just want to acknowledge that today is Juneteenth. And if you're not familiar with Juneteenth, because if you're like me, I'm a little old, I'll admit, um, that wasn't something that was taught in the history books. So, but it was around, it was having people around me, like Annie Ferguson, who shared with me the importance of Juneteenth. And really, it took over two years since the Emancipation Proclamation for slaves to be freed in the last and remote of slave states in Texas. And so that's the day that slaves were freed. And so it's important to recognize the, the significance of this day in US history. And I think we can learn a lot from history and learn a lot from each other because without somebody like an Ernie, Annie Ferguson in my life, I probably would have been today, today's year old but, uh, when I learned about Juneteenth. So thank you, Annie, and thank you to everybody, including our speakers. We have such a great lineup. Um, so we're going to be able to learn from them today as well. All right, so a little housekeeping before we get in to the content today. Um, we will, we want you to chat, 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 chat through that chat box. We, uh, we love to have that community engagement. Um, when you have questions, please pop them into the Q&A box because we will answer those, our speakers will answer them, and we'll pick one question to, uh, to ask one of our speakers or to ask each speaker after their presentation. So chat in the chat box, questions in the uh, Q&A box. That really helps us and helps our speakers really sift through the questions that are being asked of them because we want to make sure we're getting as many questions answered as possible. It is Juneteenth. Denise, did you hear me talk about my little story with Annie Ferguson? Uh, it'll be on the recording. <laughs> yes. So um, thank you so much for investing your time today. And that's enough out of me. I want to, and let me uh, share my screen to give Kate, just a introduction that she deserves. Well, I say that. <laughs> oh, technology. <laughs> um, but we have Kate Brown as our first speaker today. And Kate is she is an amazing person she's a business intelligence officer or business intelligence manager and a big fan of tableau desktop and prep and so when she's not visiting or prepping she uh, you can find her out on the golf course and she's today representing the boston tug so kate take it away thanks emily hope everyone's having a good friday so i'm gonna just uh, share my screen and I'm going to talk to you today. We're going to talk a little bit more about concepts around why I use prep and what I love about it and how it really helps you to become better at building um, better desktop, um, Tableau desktop visualizations and workbooks. Um, so for those of you who have seen me do anything on prep before, normally what I'll do is walk through kind of a real life situation. But today I want to talk to you and present four different reasons of why you probably want to think about using prep. Um, so just a little bit about me, like Emily said, I'm a business intelligence manager. I live in Massachusetts. 
Um, and I use SQL, um, primarily Oracle is what I've been using, desktop and prep on a regular basis. I'm also one of the co-leaders of the Boston Tug, along with Jackie and Brian Moore and Will Strauss and Dustin Cabral. And I'm really said a big fan of both prep and desktop. Just a little bit about me personally, I love traveling um, locally within the US and internationally. And one of my favorite sp uh, spots that I've been to over the last few years was Inishmore, which is one of the Aran Islands. Um, and I spent a week there in 2018. Uh, and that's just me walking down from Dunangus, if anyone's familiar with Inish Inishmore. Um, it's a beautiful, absolutely beautiful place to visit. Um, and I can't wait to go back. And if you do follow me on Twitter, you know um, I love golf. That's kind of my primary obsession in life. And my dog, who's a Sharpay. And I love my husband too. I just don't tweet about him that much. Um, and my contact information's right here. So you can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, and I also have a blog um, called fairwaysandbiz.com. All right, so we're gonna get into it. Four reasons that I use prep for my data sources. The number one reason um, is that you can connect all kinds of sources. So you may need to connect um, text files, Excel files, a database, multiple databases. You can do that in prep. Now you can do cross database joins in desktop as well. But I think doing it outside of um, desktop is really a better practice. You know, I know I've got questions from people and we look at what they've got and they're connecting to a text file and they're connecting to Oracle and to SQL Server and trying to do a cross uh, database join within desktop. When we move that out and we do all that prep work in prep itself, they found that they had a better experience their workbook worked better. It was easier to understand their calculations because they took the joins and the data set creation outside of desktop and really used desktop to do the visualization aspect of it. So you can see there are um, just over 50 built-in connectors within prep. So you can connect to different file types like access, PDF, Excel, text files. You can connect to a data source on the Tableau server and you can also connect to an extract. Um, and then those are all of the server um, connection options that you have. And then you also always have the option of a JDBC and an ODBC connection. One really cool thing about prep is you can actually union different data sources in prep, which I don't believe that you can do. Last I checked, you weren't able to do that in desktop. So, if you can do that in desktop, someone correct me, but my understanding is you, um, you cannot union different data sources in desktop. So it's really powerful um, and you've got a lot of options to connect and taking that work outside of desktop and doing it kind of upstream of the visualization, I've found has really been um, better for me performance wise and just kind of keeping a very clean workbook. So reason number two is one of my favorite things in prep is how easy it is to clean and manipulate your data. You know, I think oftentimes we get data that's messy or it needs to be worked because it doesn't necessarily meet our needs. Maybe we had an old hierarchy in a database and we've made a change and our system hasn't upgraded yet to match that hierarchy. We can create and uh, create fields or do some grouping to fix that without impacting our source data. And PrEP has several built-in tools that make point and clicking um, super easy. It's really just point and click and change. So you can change data types, you can remove letters, you can remove numbers without having to write a regex, it's just point and click. You can get rid of extra spaces all with the click of a mouse. There are multiple options for grouping values. You can do it manually like you can do in desktop, or you can try the built-in options of grouping by common characters, spelling, or pronunciation. And if you're interested in the technical aspects of how that all works, Tableau has a great article out there that explains um, those different grouping options and how they work. The other thing that's awesome is that you can just right-click and either keep values or exclude values. So what I'm gonna do is just jump over into desktop 
I mean, sorry, jump over into prep and we're going to look at some cleaning. So if anyone's a fan of Dave Matthews Band, uh, what I did was I downloaded all of the set lists from 2019 from the website. Um, and it's kind of ugly. <laughs> um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some cleanup. So you can see in some of them, um, I called the, the heading value and some I called values. Now these are exactly the same and I want to combine them. So I'm going to click on values and I'm just going to drop it on top of value and it's going to merge those, which is great. So if you're working with files, um, especially if it's, you know, something that you've had historically and all of a sudden someone changes a name and they don't understand the importance of that to you, you can solve that by just dragging and dropping on top of the old column name and then you've got everything merged together. So the other thing I can see here is um, I was pretty sloppy when I was creating uh, the categories for what each of my values are. So I've got state spelt wrong and I've got set list multiple times. I've got show notes and I've got notes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to group these together and we're going to look first. I'm going to click on the three dots. Um, whenever you're looking for anything in prep, click on the three dots or right click. Uh, but this is where your powerful men menus are going to be. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to group my values and let's try it off of spelling and see what we got. All right, so now if I click on set list, what I can see is it combined them all. And then it looks like a group date. So it group date with state and state, and I don't want that. So I can just unclick these. And now I can group state and state. And one trick when you're grouping, I want to keep state that's spelt right. So I'm going to click on the one that's spelt wrong first. Then I'm going to hit the control key, select, look, select the one that I want and group them. Whatever you select last is going to be the default name that's going to populate in the field. So if you've got one that's matching the way that you want it, the easiest thing to do is just do that and then combine them. And then what I can do is the same for notes and right click and group those. And again, that's so easy, just point and click and you can do that. The other thing too here is table names from a union. Uh, what's gonna come through is my table names and this is an Excel file, so these are the names of my tabs. I want these to be a date field. Right now they're a string and all I need to do is come up here to that ABC and change it to a date. I mean, that's just so easy. I don't know that it gets much easier than that. So those are a couple of quick um, cleaning tips that I think are really helpful. And All right, so number three is flexible unions. So if you're doing a lot of unioning in, um, if you're doing a lot of unioning, you're gonna run into an issue, um, you know, depending upon um, what, what you're using for data sources. And typically when you do a union, they have to be the same data source. It has to have the same number of columns. Your data types need to be the same and your columns need to be in the same order. But prep does not abide by those rules. Um, after you union the data, what you're gonna see is that we can manipulate that. It's not gonna error out on us and then we can clean it up. So I'm gonna jump back over into prep. And we're gonna look over here. So I've got um, a CSV file or a text file and I've got an Excel file. And what I wanna do is I wanna uh, union these together. So I'm gonna click and then I'm gonna drag up to my clean one and where it says union and you can see kind of that orange box is highlighted, I'm gonna drop it. And now I have a union. And what you're gonna get is this menu which is really helpful because I can see that region only exists in my clean one and month name only exists in my orange. And now what I can do is look at my data and I can say, okay, location and region are the same. At some point, not only did they change the file type on me to be from an Excel file, but they also changed the headings. So what I can do again is just drag and combine these. 
And then I've got my total. Total looks good. My region is over here now. And what I can do is go through and combine. So my total and my transaction, you're gonna see this is a string and this is a number. I can still combine these. And what's gonna happen is that's gonna be a string, but again, we learned in the last one, I can just click and change that to a whole number. So it's great, like this um, file generated by, it doesn't exist in my other field, but it's not gonna throw an error. Prep really has that great flexibility with how you work with unions. So if you're someone um, who does a lot of unioning, I was just like, this is the best thing I've ever seen. I was so excited for this. And that may say more about me being a complete nerd than anything else in the world. But um, it's really powerful, I think, when you work with a lot of unions to be able to have that flexibility to do that. And then another big reason that I use prep is um, I will use it to aggregate a data source, um, but I also use it to export um, out details. And normally when I work in desktop, what I like to do is really for most of what I do is aggregate the data up because ultimately I don't, not everyone really needs record level detail for everything that we're doing. So I like to have that aggregated data set there and then really talk to my users about, okay, so if we do this, what are the things that you're gonna wanna research? So in this example that I built in prep, what we were looking at are um, help desk tickets. So I just mocked up some data for help desk tickets, and I wanted to look at repeat tickets. So what I have done here is I've created some aggregated steps, and then what I did was brought the aggregation into desktop. And let's say you know we're working on some project around repeat tickets and we really want to focus on you know password resets and user education so those are the two that we're going to highlight that our project's really going to be tailored around instead of bringing in every single ticket every single employee every single agent what i can do in prep is really aggregate that up i can do the joins to my employee data i can get the counts for what i'm looking for but then I can narrow down the focus of what I'm looking at. You know, I want user education and password resets. I can filter my record level detail here for just those two and bring that in as a data set. So I'm really limiting the amount of record level detail that I'm bringing in and really targeting it to be specific for what the person needs when they're doing this. And so those are my four things um, that I wanted to share with you today about why I love prep, and I hope this was helpful. Are there any questions? Oh, yes. Yes, okay. there are questions. <laughs> um, okay, so I, let's see. Uh, there are so many questions. I don't even know which one to pick because they're all like, I want you to answer. Okay. <laughs> You'll have I will stay on and answer questions. Yeah. yeah. But they're all so good. So I'm like trying to figure out which one to pick. Um, do you happen to know, I don't know if you've had an opportunity to play around with 2020.2 and the, or the new, um, the data noodles. Have you? I have not, not enough yet. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yep. Okay. Because there were a couple of questions around that. Um, and then and even, you know, I think with Noodles too, I think it's important to think about um, how much data you need and how much are you bringing in. And then, you know, even with the relationships and that you can build that now, like I don't have enough knowledge on it, but I still think it gets back to the fact of, am I bringing in more information than I need? And if I am, how can I cut that back? So, but I think I need to learn more about Noodles, so. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> And then um, somebody asked, William asked, with the merge, does it overwrite the existing rows or does it append them to the existing table? It, it, it'll append, it, so if the values, is, it, it doesn't overwrite the rows. So you're going to keep all of your records. You know, if two of your values are the same, it's going gonna, it's gonna to look like they're merged in the, in the data pane. But when you look at your data, it will be in there. Does that, if that doesn't answer the question, William, 
feel free to um, respond to it and I can look at um, the Q&A and try to answer that a little bit more. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, let's I really appreciate uh, Kate taking the time to provide us this really insightful look at um, Tableau Prep. I think, Kate, there's so many good questions in the Q&A box uh, for you to answer, or at least provide your perspective on it. Um, so thank you so much, Kate. And next up, we have Robert Breed. So let me give him a very warm welcome. I will share my screen so that way we can see his information here. All right, and Robert is a Tableau guru who is highly active on the Tableau community forums and is repping the Orlando Tug. So Robert, thank you so much for joining us today. You're gonna to talk about the new data model. So I think that that's a really great um, segue from where Kate was talking about with prep. So Robert, take it away. Robert, I think you're on mute. Oh, thanks a lot, Emily, for the introduction. Um, can you guys all hear me? We can. Good, all right. Well, let me share my screen real quick. I'm going to be doing a presentation on the new data model in Tableau 2020.2. Um, and this is a link right here to where I have it published on Tableau Public. If you'd like to follow around, uh, follow along on the presentation, uh, it's all posted right there, and I have this link on every slide. Uh, first. So go ahead and take a look if you want to follow along. So my name is Robert Breen. I have been using Tableau for about five years. Um, I'm an analytics consultant at DataBrains. Uh, like Emily said, I do a lot of work on the Tableau forums. I try to answer at least four to five questions a day. Um, and I also work with the Orlando Tug. And uh, just a fun fact about me, um, don't tell my wife, I am secretly teaching my two-year-old how to use Tableau, and I fully expect him to be a Zen master by the time. No pressure. Uh, so like I said, I do a lot of work on the Tableau forums, and I'd like to kind of plug that. Um, if you've never been to the forums, it's a great place to uh, post your questions and get answers um, from other experts without within the community. So you can you can post sample data, you can put your workbook up, ask a question anytime you get stuck. Um, don't spin your wheels. Uh, ask the question on Tableau forums and uh, people will gladly help you try to solve your problem and, and a lot of times your problem will get uh, your question will get answered within you know 10 or 15 minutes uh, and again like i said you know it's just a little joke that i was uh teaching my son uh liam how to use tableau uh this is him reading the big book of dashboards um he hasn't told me what he thought about it yet and this is him uh, helping me with a makeover Monday too. So to my presentation. So I'm going to be going over the Tableau data model in 2020.2. If, if you're not on 2020.2 yet, um, you will see some different screens. Um, but this is a new addition that was added to Tableau in uh, around April, I believe, a couple months ago. A couple key te takeaways from this presentation. Um, I simply want you to understand how to use the new data model and what you can do with it. And uh, you know, the biggest point here uh, will be uh, to kind of get your wheels turning on how you can use the data model in creative ways. Uh, like I said, it just came out a couple months ago. And um, we're just kind of getting started understanding uh, what it can do and what problems can be solved with it. So uh, just kind of get your wheels turning on that. 
uh, agenda of the of presentation, I'm going to go through the 2020.2 data model, just an overview, a simple example, and show you a few problems that can be solved using the data model instead of using joins and blends. And we're even going to visualize uh, more than one fact table together in one workbook, which in the past has been uh, difficult to do, possible but difficult in Tableau. Uh, and you can even do uh, what used to be table calculations, are still table calculations, but you can you can do things like year over year, month over month, without using table calculations and using the data model instead. So let's move on to Tableau Desktop. I have two workbooks up. Uh, I, I, this is the workbook here that you guys can download off of Tableau Public, but I will be doing most of the work in a blank workbook uh, so I can demo uh, some of the examples. So the first example I'm going to show is just how to use the new data model uh, instead of using joins. So let me connect the data. I'm going to connect to a text file and I'm going to connect to SuperSore data. So now that I connect to the SuperSore data, it looks a little different than uh, in the past. Very, very similar, but a, a little bit different. Now I want to join this or add a relationship. Um, with a different table called uh, people. And you see this is a little different as well than you're probably used to. When I drag this table in, you get a noodle instead of a join window. So I'm just gonna let go and a box will come up to edit the relationship. I'm gonna add a relationship on region equals region. And you'll see that tables uh, are kept separately instead of uh, creating one big table like the Tableau previous version uh, used to do. This region table is joined on west, uh, region equals region from this table. I'm just gonna add a couple more tables here. I'm gonna add some state information, the relationship will be state equals state name, and uh, you get the third table here with state name and state ID. And I'm gonna add one more table uh, for ages. For some reason, I need uh, the regional people's ages. Um, I can join, uh, add a relationship here on person equals person. And I have a data model set up. I'm gonna show you just so you know how this would have gone in the old joining method, how it would have looked um, in the past, so you can see the difference. So this is sample superstore. We'll go really quick since you just saw this. In the past, you would have had a join instead of the relationship, and it would have created this big table. So overall, I show, I show you how to do the data model, that simple example, all to say that the model is going to operate exactly like the um, join, old join process, but it has additional capabilities. So you see that this is a table built with the old joining with orders and people, and the new relationship process uh, comes out with the same exact answer. It's just going to be more powerful so I recommend using the new relationship process um, instead of using joins to begin with. So here's where it gets fun. Um, in the past, if you were joining two different fact tables, and, and I'll describe what that means, um, there were problems. So I, I am joining sample superstore sales with coffee chain sales with the new data model. I get an answer of $2.3 million in Superstore sales and $819,000 in coffee chain sales. Uh, if I would have joined those tables together instead of using a data model, I come out with 2.2 million in Superstore and over a million in coffee chain sales, which I'll show you is the wrong answer. So let's go over to my workbook and 
set that up. I'm going to connect to a new data source here. I'm going to connect to Superstore. And just to show you uh, what the answer is, let me just bring in sales. Sales are 2.297 million. And coffee chain by itself. is 819,000. So if I join these two tables together, uh, we'll just do a full outer join on state equals state and state equals state. Now, Coffee chain sales becomes one million, over one million, which we just we know is the wrong answer. Um, but that just showed you what coffee chain sales were. Let me start this guy over and do it as the data model. We have store, and we have coffee chain with a relationship instead of a join. State equals state, and order date equals date. So over here, we have 2.9, or 2.297, and 819,000. Um, just a, a little bit of an explanation why, uh, why this problem was a problem in the past um, is because when you join many to many uh, tables together, you end up with duplicate rows. On this 5-1-2017, on the corrected way through the data model, we have one row for 4,031 and one row for 1,562. Within the wrong way, while doing it uh, with a join, you end up with three rows of 1,562 and four rows of 4,031. All of this to say, once you upgrade to 2020.2, uh, you can now use multiple back tables together and come up with the right answer instead of next I'll show you guys a budget example. Uh, budget versus actual. So if any of you have ever used uh, tried to compare budget and actual in Tableau, um, you probably found that you have to union your data together um, instead of doing a join. And the problem with that is some data sources cannot be unioned together. Say you have a database connection where you're getting your sales data from and your budget exists in a spreadsheet. Within Tableau desktop, you're not able to uh, do a union on those sources. Uh, within Tableau Prep, like we just saw, you are able to do a union. Um, so let me do this example in Tableau desktop. I'm going to add a new data source, a text file, and guess what? It's going to be Superstore. And I'm going to bring in budget information, Superstore budget. And the relationship will be on region equals region and year equals year. So you can see the budget. Say for 2016 in Central is 100,000, and 2016 in East is 150,000. And this table has your sales information. No union, no join, just a relationship. Now when I go to visualize this data, add region, year, I'm going to make this guy discrete first, bring year in. Bring in sales and bring in budget. And it worked. So in Central, I have 100,000 budget versus 103,000 in sales and 150,000 for East and 128,000 in sales. I'm going to make a small change just to reiterate the point of uh, how joins caused problems in the past. I'm going to get rid of Superstore budget. I'm going to do this as a join instead. 
we can make it a full outer join. Region equals region and year equals year. Exactly the same as before. And I go over to my sheet and the budget is now 46 million. Uh, and apparently, you know, no one's performing well because we're nowhere near 46 million. Uh, and, uh, you know, to re reiterate, it was a many to many join that caused this problem. For every row in the data, this 100,000 budget got duplicated over and over and over. And not with, and so uh, if you use the data model, you come out to the right answer instead of using a join. Let me go back to where I have the correct answer. And I'm just gonna make this guy a little prettier for you guys. I move sales and budget to columns. And I add a dual axis. I make sales a bar chart, make budget a Gantt bar chart, synchronize these axes, move this guy. And we have a very simple uh, sales versus budget using the new data model. Uh, next here, I have an example doing year over year, month over month, and day over day without doing uh, any table calculations. I'm, uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to show you the first example, day over day. And if you'd like to uh, see month over month, year over year, go ahead and download this workbook from Tableau Public. So I'm going to bring it up this text table. So I have two columns in my data, one for sales and one for sales yesterday. So you can see that on 1-3-2016, the sales were $16. And on 1-4, they were 289. And I brought in the 16 here uh, with no table calculations. This is a column. So now, if lat yesterday is a column, no table calculations will be needed. And day over day will be a simple calculation of sales minus sales yesterday divided by the Now. How do we do that? Let's go over to our blank data. I'm going to add a new connection. It's going to be a text file. And I add Superstore. Now this one gets a little tricky. Um, and this is this is one of those examples to show you what the data model could do and and get you to start thinking about creative ways. I'm going to name this today. I'm gonna to bring in a, a table that I created. Now, a lot of times this date table, let me add the relationship first on order date equals date. A lot of times you have a date table like this in your database. If not, it can be created in Excel. That's what I did here. All I did was take the date, so one two, yesterday on one two was was January first, uh, and it keeps going down. So one eleven yesterday was one ten, um, and this column needs to be available in your dates table to make this work. I'm going to call this dates. Now here's where the power of the mo data model comes in. I'm going to add in Superstore again. And this time, I'm going to add the relationship on yesterday equals order date instead of date equals order date. And just so you can see, this is the exact same data. You don't need a new data source. Um, it is connecting to the exact same text file, and it's the exact same data. I'm going to call this last day, and I'm going to go over to a sheet. So now. I bring in dates, and sales. You can see that sales exist twice. Sales exist in the last day table, and sales exist in the today table. I'll bring in sales from today, and I'll bring in sales from yesterday. And you can see no table calculations involved. You can have yesterday's data as a column 
and write a simple calculation. Uh, sales minus sales yesterday divided by sales yesterday. And you're going to come out with day over day. It's really powerful what the new model can do. So in summary, uh, I hope you, you have a good understanding of the new data model. And you know, it's the model is so new. Uh, give it a try, upgrade to 2020.2, and just try to use it to solve different problems, and, and you'll find that it's uh, extremely useful. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Robert. Um, we have several questions for you to answer today. Um, I right. am just going to pick one because I'm like, like with Kate's, so many good questions. So um, this question comes from Bruce. So how do we know um, that the new data model correctly determines the aggregation to use? Um, he knows that he's going to get that question from an internal client. Uh, so Tableau uh, keeps the table separate and does a query against both tables, uh, similar to a blend, but unlike a blend, it uh, since the tables are stored differently differently in the model, separately in the model, um, you it's not possible to lose any data. So Tableau is picking which kind of join is uh, um, should be used based on what you drag into the view. Okay. Um, well, you have a lot of questions. Uh, so many people have really been engaged with your presentation. Um, oh, here's another one that I'll just, I know I'm kind of breaking my rule of only answer, asking one question, um, but I think that this is pretty relevant. So how many, uh, many of us have legacy workbooks created before 2020.2? How can you salvage things like groups and worksheets that are, have already been built with the older approach, pre-noodles, and seamlessly use this approach? Um, the best way to do that is, you know, once you have the workbook, you're gonna have to create a new data source and rebuild what you had built in the data source, any joins that you have built, uh, any unions that you have built and rebuild it. Uh, and you're probably going to have to, I haven't done exactly that use case. Uh, the, the groups may or may not uh, stay intact. I believe they will not stay intact. So you have to rebuild the groups if you had grouped anything within Tableau. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Robert. Really appreciate it. And just as a reminder to everybody participating today or watching the replay, if there's some key takeaway, some aha, some really great piece of advice or knowledge that you picked up from one of our speakers or all of them, make sure you show them some love on social media or the Tableau forums or however you share your information out. That really, I think, helps our speakers as well. Um, it makes them feel, I think, really good too, to know that people got some value out of their presentations. So share what you've learned through today's and all of our episodes with uh, just a little note about the, pre uh, the presenter and what you learned from their presentation. So thank you so much, Robert. That was so great. And now, I'm going to welcome Sedale. Let me share. Let's see. There we go. All right. So, and I'll present. There we go. All right. So, Sedale is a uh, digital insights analyst and a huge Tableau fan. And he's repping the DC tug. So, Sedale, welcome to the Data Fam Community Jam. And I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, and really excited to be here. Um, let me share my screen. Let's get to the pause. All right, can everyone see it? Looks good. Fantastic. 
Um, so again, uh, thanks everybody for hanging out with us today. Um, my name is Sidel, and this is going to be a beginner's guide to getting certified in Tableau. So a little bit of a, a pivot on the, the past couple of speeches, but hopefully just as valuable. So I'm gonna go over a few things today. First and foremost, who I am, so you guys have an understanding of that. I'll talk about um, briefly all of the different Tableau certifications that are available. Um, some of the questions I got when I first um, received my certification. I'll talk about resources for certification, uh, and then I'll end with some of the benefits that I found um, that are a little bit uh, less obvious and some ones that I think you might find pretty useful. So first and foremost, who am I? Um, as Emily mentioned, in my day job, I'm a digital insights and intelligence analyst, uh, which is a bunch of fancy words for I tell my clients this, uh, the answer to this question. First and foremost, what are people saying about my client and their business uh, and why? And most importantly, what should they do about it? There's a lot of Tableau involved. There's a lot of uh, social analysis uh, as well. I'm also an adjunct professor at American University where I teach social media strategies. I'm a member of the DC TUG, which is how I got involved with the data fam uh, and Tableau in general. Born and raised in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, I currently live in Northern Virginia, in the Northern Virginia area, and went to the University of Virginia, home of the reigning March Madness champions, which if you're a college basketball fan, you know, UVA won two seasons ago. Um, but last season was cut short due to COVID, so uh, I'm claiming we are still the reigning champions. I'm mostly available on Twitter and LinkedIn, especially when it comes to all things Tableau and data viz. I spend a lot of time in both of those places, uh, and, and I'm currently building out my uh, Tableau public profile. Most important to you all, though, I am a Tableau desktop specialist. I got that certification uh, probably four or five weeks ago now. Um, it's been really awesome for a lot of reasons that I'll share shortly, um, but happy to tell you guys uh, how to also start your journey to getting certified. Just as important as how to get certified, though, uh, and who I am, I want to talk about what I, who I am not. I am not a Tableau Zen Master, and yes, this is what I think about when I think of our Tableau Zen Masters as older, wise, beige people. Uh, I am nowhere near a computer scientist. I code enough to be dangerous, uh, but I am not a uh, Flairless twin or a Luke Stanky or, or some of the folks that have far better knowledge in that world than I do. Uh, and I am slowly building my Tableau public profile, but I am not yet a celebrity. If you don't know who this individual is, uh, talk to five Tableau people and ask them who their inspiration is. I guarantee one will give you the name Andy Kriebel. Uh, he is a celebrity in the Tableau public world and in Tableau in general, really. Uh, and I encourage you, if you haven't heard that name, uh, to look him up uh, because he has some really awesome stuff to share. Really quickly to go over all of the certifications and what's available. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a Tableau desktop specialist. Uh, the next level up, which is what I'm going for currently, will be the Tableau certified associate. Uh, and then the, the last level is Tableau Certified Professional, all for Tableau Desktop. And then Tableau Server has two certifications as well, the Server Level so Associate Exam and the Server Level Professional Certification. Um, and I mentioned that because no matter where you are in the world, uh, you, can, you can be on the path to one of these certifications. You don't have to be exceptional to be any of these sorts of things. You just uh, need to have a certain level of experience. And I'll talk a bit about that shortly. When I got certified, uh, which was a, a really cool moment for me, uh, as soon as I posted it, there were tons and tons of uh, supportive messages, uh, but a lot of questions as well from people that were interested in getting certified. And they kind of fell into these three buckets. The first being how to prepare for the exam, what was the exam experience like, which I'll say is a, a really smart question that I wish I had also asked about getting certified. Um, so I'll talk about that today. Uh, and ultimately, but why? Why get certified? Why, uh, what was the value of it? What I got out of it? And so I'm gonna talk about all three of those things. 
first and foremost, how do you get uh, prepared for the exam? How do, what resources do you need to have available for the exam? Um, I would say the first thing I would definitely think about is the Tableau e-learning. Um, and it's essentially what I like to call the textbook for uh, the exam. A lot of the questions that are asked during the e-learning learning paths are also questions that you'll see in the exam. And one thing to note here is if um, you sign up for the e-learning, you can actually have it free for 90 days. And just for some context, I started in late, mid to late April, and I got my certification in late May. So uh, May, late May, early June. So there's a lot you can do in 90 days. Um, I'll also mention relative to the other speeches as well, the e-learning paths also have um, courses for Tableau prep and for and there's a, a new features section that'll go over the data model. So if you have questions about those, uh, the e-learning is good for that as well. Um, I'll also say, you know, if if not, if Tableau e-learning is number one for resources, 1A is the data fam. These the people on this. Uh, call and the people that you encounter as you go through this stuff are definitely people uh, you want to use as resources for getting certified. Sarah Bartlett, who you've heard and is on this call, was very, very helpful to me uh, as I started to get my skills together and started to prepare for the exam. I was just speaking yesterday with Katie Wagner uh, about how to kind of take the next steps and what, what I need to do going forward. And everyone has been so helpful to me so far. And, and they're all all great resources and many of them are Tableau ambassadors which means that they have taken it upon themselves to be a resource uh, for you so definitely take advantage of those individuals the last thing I'll mention are YouTube videos I, I find at least um, that seeing the features of Tableau being used and getting to use them yourself are great ways to um, <clears throat> build your skills not only for the exam but in general get better at Tableau, so I would definitely encourage you to use uh, use and leverage those uh, things. This particular image that you're seeing is the Tableau VizConnect um, channel, which is a webinar series that happens a little bit earlier. It's in the IST time zone, so um, for those in different countries. So in the East Coast, it happens around six or seven in the morning. Uh, there was one this morning um, related to Figma, a couple of VizConnects ago, Katie Wagner did layout containers. Uh, Brian Moore did one on building business dashboards. It's a very, very useful resource. Uh, you can see here on this image on the bottom left, the Playlist Twins had uh, a session as well. So uh, a really great resource and a really great way to not only build your skills, but also um, prepare yourself for different elements of the exam. In terms of the exam itself, um, the environment is kind of a desktop on top of a desktop. So uh, it's in a full screen with uh, the proctors viewing you through Zoom. And so uh, a big pro tip here is do not um, leave that environment. Um, I actually had, uh, it was using Zoom just like this and the proctor, uh, I was trying to move a window and I accidentally clicked on that top bar that you get on Zoom. Uh, which obviously put me in Zoom and not in the environment. And she actually had to stop me uh, and kind of reset everything. Uh, so A, don't do that. But B, um, don't hit escape. Don't, you know, those sorts of key shortcuts that you might be used to uh, because you will leave the environment, which is a no-no, unfortunately. Uh, the exam itself has 60 questions. 22 of them are multiple choice or multiple response. Uh, and then eight of them actually use Tableau, so you'll be able to down, upload uh, data sets to Tableau and answer questions from it. You have 60 minutes total, which is actually a fair amount, I, I find to be a fair amount of time. Uh, if you know, if you're prepared and you know the answers, especially on the theoretical side, uh, it's pretty easy to get through those and uh, under two minutes per question, and then you can save that time for the hands-on version of it. Um, it took me about 40 minutes to um, complete the exam, and that includes time to review my answers. So um, you, you should have a fair amount of time, especially if you are prepared for it. But now I wanna, if I can pitch you a little bit on some uh, benefits of getting certified, why you should think about it. Um, I, obviously, if you get the badge, it looks great on your LinkedIn. It looks great for talking to employers and telling them that you're certified for Tableau. 
Uh, but there are a few other benefits that I think were really useful that I found uh, so far that I'd love to go over. The first is he kind of sends out a back signal to people that A, you're a part of the community, but B, um, that you're certified and that um, you may have a skill set that's you know useful to a lot of people. And so the first thing I got was a lot of questions that I could answer from people, which I was really um, happy to do. I love learning and then teaching people what I learned, which is why I became an adjunct teacher. Um, but also, you know, I got the opportunity, this amazing opportunity to speak with you all today um, and wrote a blog post, which I can share uh, after this presentation. Uh, and, and so it just gives you a way to kind of get your name out there, um, which I would encourage for anyone that's trying to, to consider that. It also helps you stand out. Um, I will say that um, I remember a day where being data driven wasn't as cool as it is now. Uh, and I can tell that, that that has created a lot of people in the data community, both uh, people that sort of dabble in it and people that are actually skilled. So getting certified helps people uh, really think of you as someone uh, that's a little bit above the fray, um, that's actually above average in terms of your skill set. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say is that it makes making business more fun. Um, I'll say, you know, once I got out of studying for the exam and taking it, I went back into Tableau and made both of these, but also uh, in making them, I found myself getting through things a lot faster, starting to get the things that are in my head um, out into, the, into Tableau uh, a lot faster than I was able to before. So if, you're, if, you, if you find yourself running into walls when you're building business, or you, you look at a makeover Monday and you're just not sure what to do with it, or workout Wednesday, uh, or things of that sort, I, I would encourage you to take some of these courses because it, it'll help you a lot, um, in addition to obviously doing some of these business uh, with Makeover Monday, or, or Sports Biz Sunday is another one. Sarah Bartlett has Iron Quest. Um, so those are another great way to prepare for the exam, but also coming out of the exam to start to use those, those skills. So hopefully um, through this, um, if anything, you understand that getting certified is definitely possible no, no matter what your skill level is. Uh, you don't have to be a Zen master. You don't have to be a computer science wizard. Um, I would say for the desktop specialist, it's, it's good to um, have at least about three to six months. Obviously, it depends on what you do in those three to six months, but um, typically that's uh, a good way to gauge where you are and, and where uh, it might be easier to take the certifications. Hopefully, uh, you have an understanding of what those certifications are uh, and the benefits. If I can pitch you one more time on the desktop specialist, it's actually 50% off uh, through the end of the month. So uh, if you are thinking about getting certified, if you are on the fence about whether or not to sign up, I would definitely encourage you to do so while it's half off. So if you consider the specialist exam is half off, the e-learning is free for 90 days, uh, you get a real discount on uh, getting certified if you to do that right now. Um, hopefully you also uh, have an understanding of some of the resources that are available to you, uh, both from the e-learning to the videos, uh, but lastly, I hope you also, you know, see that, see me also as a resource. I, I'm here, you know, and I'm available to help people. I wrote this blog here um, on Adam Miko's blog related to um, how my journey and how I got uh, into Tableau, but also how I started to get into the, the certifications and things like that. So um, happy to share that resource. Uh, with you, but if you have any questions at all, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me on LinkedIn uh, or Twitter or honestly, I'm, I'm on most social platforms and I'm likely the only Sedale you've ever met. So uh, it should be fairly easy to find me. I'm also on Tableau Public and I'll start to uh, continue to build that, that place out as well. Um, so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions or um, head into the Q&A as well. Well, thank you so much, Sadale. That was really great. Um, we've had several um, questions in the um, the chat about just e-learning, and I think we've got a couple of resources that we put in there for the links to the e-learning platform. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, how much time did you like? 
you know, you gave that time frame in terms of like when you started the e-learning versus when you yeah. got your certification, but like actually how many hours did you actually spend? Did you track that? Um, <laughs> are you really data driven? Um, <laughs> but how many hours just to give people some context? Cause I mean, you could have been like a hundred hours a week on it or 10. Yeah, I, I definitely, it's, it's not 100 hours. Uh, the great thing about the e-learnings, and if, if you're familiar with the, the free training videos as well, Tableau does a really good job of not overwhelming you with 30-minute video tutorials. Um, so I, I would say, I think the desktop one e-learning is roughly four, four to six hours, um, which is the, the only one you really need for the specialist. Um, I did do desktop one and two just to, to kind of make sure that I was really prepared for it. So I would say no more than 25 to 30 hours total. Um, and that was really probably an hour a day from April, mid-April through mid to late May. And then what level, uh, like what else were you doing to really help solidify those skills? Um, because I mean, is it where you can, you know, study the information on e-learning and then go to take the test or do you really need to have multiple um, practical applications to really get to that point where you'd be successful in passing the uh, certification. Yeah, for sure. I, I would say I am definitely a, a learn by doing sort of person. So a lot of the time, so what I would do, especially in, in um, aspects of Tableau that I wasn't already familiar with, um, I would go through up through. So every um, module has like a module overview, then there's a demo and then there's an activity. Um, so after the activity, I would kind of go through that data set and, and do a couple other examples. So in addition to the one that they gave you, um, just to continue to practice that. And then where possible, um, you know, try to do a, a makeover Monday or try to do a, use a data set that they already had um, for work if you're working in Tableau. Uh, try to apply those things immediately so that they stay fresh. Okay. Um, and then somebody also asks, um, can you compare exam questions to e-learning badge questions? Was it easier or similar or harder? Uh, I would say a touch harder. I wouldn't, I wouldn't assume if you did, I think if you got most of the, the questions right in the, the badges, so I have four of the badges, um, if you got most of those questions right and you felt pretty confident in it, you should be okay in the exam. But if you struggled with those badges, I would spend a little bit more time with it because they are they are a little bit harder. It is a little bit deeper of a test. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you so much for your presentation today. I think it's really helpful. Um, and thank you for sharing the blog link so that way people can read about your journey as well. So very excited to have you on today and looking forward to seeing more amazing stuff from you as well. Absolutely. Thank you guys. Thank you. All right, so next up, we have James Smith, and James is going to be sharing about Sports Viz Sunday. So let's welcome James. He's an analytic consultant and sports enthusiast, and he's sharing about a Tableau social project called Sports Viz Sunday, and specifically about the June edition of that. So thank you, James, so much. I'll stop sharing my screen and toss it over to you. Thanks very much, Emily. I um, hope you can hear me okay. And I'd also like to introduce uh, Spencer, who's on the call. Um, it's a little bit of a last minute thing. So um, Spencer will be joining me. He's one of the co-hosts along with uh, Simon Beaumont, who's in the UK, and Chris Westlake, who is uh, up in Scotland. And um, unfortunately, they can't, can't be here to join us today, but uh, Spencer is dialing in from the US, so I'll go ahead and share my screen now. Awesome. Can you all see that okay? Yes, we can. Perfect, yeah, so um, just a very quick introduction um, before we get started and, and also thank you uh, all the other speakers and all the other organizers today. Um, really enjoyed that presentation on the certifications. I've, I've just gone through uh, one of the service certifications and um, everything that Sadal was saying about the e-learning and, and being able to go through it, especially as it's free at the moment, is, is um, really useful as well. So, 
Um, I am Joe Smith. I'm an analytics consultant based in uh, London and I started off using Tableau maybe um, four years ago while I was working at EY as an accountant and um, working with some finance data. But um, the way that I, I learned Tableau and really got involved with the tool and with the community was using uh, the sports data that I, I loved um, outside of my work. So um, for me, it was finding something that I was really passionate about, looking for some data. Um, and when, when I was looking for that data, I realized that uh, it was quite difficult to get. This is, this is three or four years ago. Um, and I noticed there was a couple of other people that were also quite engaged with this, this sports data world. Uh, one of them was Spencer and one of them was, was Simon. And so together we started this, this Sports Biz Sunday uh, community. So I'll let Spencer introduce himself as well. Yeah, hey, I'm Spencer Bauke, a consultant at Tessellation and a member of Sports Viz Sunday. Um, yeah, I'm excited to uh, talk to everyone today about uh, the, the things going on in the community. Awesome. So just before we get started, it's been a, a strange time um, for, for many reasons over the past three months. Um, but uh, now that some sports are kind of on, on the edge of coming back, we've, we've seen the Premier League start off uh, in the last few days. I just thought we'd open up with a, a quick discussion about what you have missed about sport in the last three months. Spencer. Oh, are you asking me what I've missed? Uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I have I have season tickets to the FC Cincinnati uh, uh, soccer team. So I've I've missed the uh, beautiful summer nights uh, going out and and watching uh, some soccer. So that's probably probably what I've missed most. Yeah, I think yeah, it's been a, it's been a, a long three months without. Um, Without the amount of, uh, I'm, I'm also a, a season ticket holder at a, uh, I think they call it football here on, uh, in Europe. So um, I'm, I'm missing being able to go to, to those games. I go with, with my dad uh, every other Saturday to, to watch the Chelsea games. So I've, I've really missed that. And it's exciting that uh, it's back, even if it isn't with, with the fans in the stadiums. It's, it's nice that we've got something to kind of talk about and, uh, and get excited about again. So. Um, over to Spencer, just to talk a little bit about what Sports Biz Sunday is and how you can get involved. Yeah, absolutely, James. So Sports Biz Sunday is a Tableau community initiative uh, that encourages everyone to take data uh, that we provide and visualize it, share it, just be part of a community that uh, loves to analyze sports. Um, and that can take you know, any form that you want it to. It's, there's not hard and fast rules to being part of the community, um, but it is a place where you can find people with similar interests and uh, a passion about sports that allows us to uh, work on our skills uh, as uh, people in the data visualization space, as well as doing it on a topic that we all find intriguing and that we're passionate about. Um, so there's a few ways to get involved in our community. And one is the monthly data challenge. So every month we post a new data set onto data.world that people in the community are able to go and use and visualize. So you can go and use the data that we provide you uh, and then go and share it on Twitter with the Sports Viz Sunday hashtag. You can also go and create visualizations with whatever data you find. It doesn't need to be ones that we've curated or provided you. Uh, you if you have a data set, if you know of a cool website that you're able to go find data at like basketballreference.com or something like that, you can go visualize it and then share it on Twitter using the hashtag or tagging us. And what we'll do is we'll include that in our weekly roundup. So what I do every Sunday is I take the work from Twitter that has been tagged with Sports Viz Sunday and I create a thread. And every week you'll see all the different people that have contributed content with this hashtag or there's content out there that maybe hasn't been tagged Sports Fist Sunday, but that I like and that I've found, and I'll share that out as well. So it's really a weekly thread of just a lot of really cool analysis, visualization, 
uh, stuff regarding sports. And uh, it's just a way to, um, you know, share people's work and have people see what everyone else in the community is doing. You can also get involved by being a guest host. So we need data uh, to provide every month and we are all busy. I know everyone is busy, but we, we are all uh, busy. And sometimes providing data each month can, um, you know, you know, get harder, especially with, you know, current events going on. So we have people uh, that step up and are guest hosts. So what you can do is uh, get a data set, or if you already have a data set, that's really cool. You can submit it to us as a guest host and you're able to go onto data.world. We'll give you access and you can go and customize your page as much as you want to. And then you're able to interact as the guest host of Sports Biz Sunday for that month. And so you take a temporary leadership you know, position within uh, the initiative and it gives people you know, some experience that they're able to um, you know, be more involved with our initiative uh, than they might be otherwise. So we really appreciate our guest hosts. We really, really uh, you know, appreciate them and know that it's not easy. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's another way uh, you can get involved. <laughs> really nice about those as well is that uh, we've got our favorite sports we've kind of got that overlap of football and soccer but um yeah what's been really nice is you've got experts in in other sports uh, so we'll talk a little bit about this month's challenge later um we've had uh people do everything from alpine downhill skiing um to winter olympic theater so it kind of um it's nice when someone has a particular passion around a, a sport and it doesn't matter if it's the, the niche sport in the world um or it is one of the, the mainstream sports that um, they, they can share the data that they've worked on, that they've got a lot of joy in. And uh, one thing that we've noticed people have, have really come back to us and said is that they, they enjoy learning about new sports. So I remember um, yeah. when Brian Moore created something on, on cricket, and I wasn't sure that he had heard about cricket, this strange game that they, they play uh, across the pond. Um, and so, so that was really nice, and it gives you an opportunity to learn both about Tableau uh, and using data, but also about different sports that you might not be familiar with. Right yeah, and you can also check out our website at sportsbizsunday.com if you're looking for more information or some of the data sets that have been part of our previous projects um, and monthly data challenges. And then we also have a new Viz Tracker uh, created by our newest member, Chris Westlake, um, and we can share more details about that later. Awesome. Um, so what, what I'd like to go over now, um, we, we, we have really enjoyed um, our participation and being able to, to meet people in the community at the conferences. So um, this is just a bit of a reflection back to Tableau Conference 19 in Vegas back in November, um, where we hosted one of our, our live sessions and it was just a really nice opportunity to um, A, kind of talk and, and bond with fellow sports data enthusiasts and also uh, to get just get all those people in the room and, and have some fun. Um, and at the end of that presentation in Vegas, we, we kind of made a bit of a promise um, back to the community about what we wanted to do going forward. Um, so there was three, three points here um, that we're going to just go over and have a look at the, the progress that we've made on those three points. Um, so the first one, people love the guest hosts idea. Uh, we, we said we'll have more and more guest hosts if possible. Um, the second was around more advanced data sets. So um, let's take uh, football for an example here where you've got results data, but um, maybe what people are interested in, in looking at is uh, the events data and tracking data. Um, you see players running around with the, the vests on that actually capture that data of where they are on the pitch every, every second of the game. Um, can we get access to that and can we start to visualize that? So uh, we'll, we'll take a look at what we're doing this month, which is, is really exciting. Um, and then finally, more collaboration. So just before uh, we presented this in, in Vegas, we had done a little bit of a, a collaboration with Sarah Barla and the Iron Quest Initiative. Um, and that, that seems to go down really well. People liked the mix of, of what Sarah's initiative uh, brings and being able to use sports data. So uh, again, some more news on that as well. Um, so I think Spencer, you're, you're gonna talk quickly about some of the, the recent guest hosts we've had. Yeah. So we have had the pleasure of having a ton of awesome guest hosts who have just given us outstanding data sets. I mean, just in the past two, three months alone, 
Uh, we've had Jacob Olsufka give us Google uh, search trends for like every different athlete you can think of, every team going back years. I mean, it's crazy. Um, and we had a lot of really cool visualizations made from it. So you should definitely check it out. Kirk Monroe providing us game by game NHL stats. And then this month has been really, really cool. Uh, Zach Geis um, provided us data on every single shot in the NBA that has been taken uh, since 1997. So you're talking, you know, uh, 5 million different shots in the location type of shot player that took it. It's really insane when you think about it to capture that level of data. But uh, if you haven't already, check it out, data.world. Uh, it's on our June project, uh, NBA shot locations data set. Um, there's been a lot of cool stuff made about it already. And so uh, this is just an example of some of the awesome people that really make this initiative um, as fun to be a part of as it is. So thank you to everyone who has been a guest host before and uh, especially some of these some of these recent hosts that are just uh, killing it. Awesome. And, and there is obviously the opportunity if uh, anyone is interested, if, if this uh, call or if you've, you've heard of it before and have, have thought about stepping forward, then uh, we'd absolutely love to hear from you. And uh, you can get in touch um, either on, on Twitter usually. Uh, we have got a little... Um, mailing box on the website so we'll, we'll put up at the end of this presentation just a link to the website and to our data.world site where a lot of the data is also hosted. So on the theme of our guest host and on the theme of basketball uh, you may have noticed that uh, this particular slide deck is very um, basketball heavy it was actually one of the, the templates on PowerPoint which is quite heavy so um, as Spencer just mentioned, uh, Zach Geis provided uh, almost 5 million records on every single shot that has been taken in the uh, NBA, which is really exciting. Um, we've already had some, some really cool submissions. I'm going to put a few of them up here on the screen for a, bit of a, a short discussion. Um, I, I think when, when you're starting to work with this level of data, uh, a lot of the samples, a lot of the tutorials that you'll be maybe used to learning in Tableau will be around the, the wonderful and much loved Superstore data set. Um, I think what the idea of these these sports, uh, these monthly challenges is to provide you with the uh, the data sets in a, a relatively clean and accessible manner and to go away and start actually using that data to, to learn the tools and try out new techniques and so on. So. Um, we've just put three up here. Uh, there's been quite a few submissions already this month and we're, we're just over halfway through it. Um, but you can see there's, there's definitely that, that trend as soon as you've got the shot data to uh, use those background images um, to show the, the, the space and place aspect of uh, the shots and where they're taken from around the court. So um, I saw earlier that this one by Ryan um, had actually kind of gone, gone a little bit viral. It had been on um, Reddit and I think um, there's a a guy, Simon, something with a German surname who tweets a lot about maps and other things that I retweeted him, and so it was getting a lot of love. Um, so I suppose one of the other thing is when you're working with data in, in sport and thinking about uh, your audience as well, it gets you uh, a lot of exposure when you when you create something that um, obviously has got a lot of people interested in, lots of fans around the world that are really enthusiastic and, and passionate about this kind of stuff. Um, so, is there any, any particular highlight on here, Spencer, that you wanted to, to pull out from the three that we've got on here that are pretty amazing? Uh, no, there's just been a lot of uh, Kobe tributes the past probably month or two, so it's been cool to see. But yeah, um, mm -hmm. the, the other yeah, nice thing all, about lots the, of cool stuff. Yeah, the, the Lakers one is just um, the, the the color schemes and the, the colors that you get because of the uh, the kits that they wear and the jerseys is uh, makes it really impactful. So um, big fan of the, the colours on these as well. And also, actually, I just want to, I do want to point out the, uh, I've not seen this too often, but the way that the, the border works on the rise of the step, like this one by uh, J.R. Kouperos, um, the way that he's, he's done this border around it, I think that just makes it look so neat. And, and the, the use of white space around uh, the different visualisations gives it a real um, sense of kind of, I, I want to read more about this. 
final promise was around um, collaboration. So as, as I've mentioned before, we've, uh, we had our autumn 2019 Iron Quest collaboration. Um, we've got something coming up, which is pretty exciting next month. It's something that we've not done before. It's a little bit different and we're gonna, we're gonna try it out. Um, so July 2020 is gonna be our collaboration month. Um, now this doesn't mean that we're necessarily collaborating with another of the initiatives. It means that you as individuals um, have the opportunity to collaborate with other uh, sports fans and sports enthusiasts to maybe come together and create something around a sport that you're really interested in. Um, so there's been some really effective examples of how this has worked in the past. Um, a couple spring to mind. One um, was Klaus and Ludovic who created uh, this amazing piece around Boris Becker's tennis career. Um, and the other one was Lindsay and uh, Kev Clerlage, who uh, created the Leopards um, visualization, which was really beautiful as well. Um, and then finally on this, we've got uh, the, uh, a Workout Wednesday collaboration coming up. Uh, so I think Spencer might know a little bit more about that, um, but that is due later on this year. So Workout Wednesday, another initiative um, that runs on a weekly basis uh, where it challenges you to try and recreate a certain visualization. So final, final little bit here, just a little bit more information on next month's collaboration month. Um, to overcome the potential technical challenge of people uh, meeting up and, and finding someone else to actually create a visualization with, um, perhaps you fancy yourself more as a bit of a storyteller, maybe you fancy your technical expertise. Um, I think this is really about bringing together people that have similar passions and interests um, that can kind of critique each other and work together to create something really, uh, really special. So to do that, we have a spreadsheet. Um, there is a tweet out already, but uh, we'll, we'll share more details as we get closer to July. Um, and it's basically just a, a Google Sheets that will allow you to enter your name, uh, enter the sports that you're interested in um, and based on that you're able to hopefully reach out to other people on that list um, find someone that is interested in a similar sport to you um, and then use that to, to get, go ahead and create your collaboration and create your sports themed biz. So with that um, thank you very much everyone for listening and thank you um, for the wonderful organizers for, for having us on. Um, there's a link there both to our website and to our data world, world. Um, and the, the data that we've got for every single challenge that we've got, plus more data sets that have been submitted um, are all available on there. Um, so thank you very, very much for listening and I hope everyone has a, a lovely weekend. Well, thank you so much, you all. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, one that came in and I know that y'all were answering them as you were doing your presentation, um, but when it comes to the location of shots in a data set, like how is that actually constructed? Is it a lat launch? Like what, how does that look in the data? Can you help us understand what that type of data looks like? Yeah, so yeah. Um, should we, okay. should we both take a shot of this? On the button. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead. It's, so the XY is, is, so it's in an XY format using the basketball court as a grid and Zach uh, has put the dimensions of what the court would be in the data.world site. So say you have a shot, you know, that's, you know, five on the x-axis and 20 on the y-axis, and that's where the shot took place. Um, that's kind of meaningless and unless you understand the size in which, you know, the court occupies but we have those dimensions on the data.world site, so it can put it in context for you. And we also, if, if you look at the um, hashtag, there's also a image going around that is really good to use for the court. It's transparent and it fits the dimensions that were provided perfectly. So that's been floating around on, uh, on the, the Twitter sphere as well. So um, I guess a follow up to that then is, um, how did he get the coordinates though in the first place? Like how did, where so did it the, um, the, the, the data providers, uh, in, I'm gonna use football as an example again, but um, we think about the big data companies that are collecting this information. So 
Opta are a huge one uh, that does this in, in Europe for all of the events within football. Um, it's either Opta or, or someone equivalent in, in basketball um, that will basically, uh, th there's a couple of ways of collecting it. They'll either have analysts that will sit there and watch the videos and they'll say, okay, that is a shot. Um, this is where it was on the, on the pitch and they will codify it that way. So that, that, that is a pretty intensive process, but that has been done. Um, the other way of doing that then is that you can, you can use machine learning to start to identify using cameras um, where on, a, on the pitch uh, the shot is taken from. Um, and then you can, you can then codify that into your X and Y's that uh, you're then able to plot onto, onto your pictures. Yeah. I, and I think specifically, uh, Zach used a Python script to scrape some back end off the MBA's website for that. So that's, I think that's the, yeah. All right. And then also a follow on is um, if you only have, like, say, a clipboard with X's and O's, how do you transpose it to coordinates? Um, so we, we do have X, so we have X, Y. So the coordinates are actually already in there for every shot. Is that? Well, um, that? and Sally, um, she, Sally asked this question. So if you want to oh, okay. provide a little more information. Um, oh, so let's see, an image. Oh, that's Sally can, she uh, followed it up with saying an image. Oh, interesting. Yeah, sorry. I, I just saw that question. Hold on. See. So I think um, that I've, I've written up a, a little bit of a, a blog on, on how this works. It's using uh, Tableau's background as images. Um, and in doing that, you, you can find an image. Uh, you can put it in the same way that a, a map might work. Um, and the coordinates effectively, it's, it, all it is is a, a scatter plot that is imposed on top of an image of a pitch. So in this case, a basketball pitch. Um, and within the data set already, uh, is one column for the X uh, and one column for the Y coordinates. And so each individual shot will have that data attached to it um, and you will then plot it as a scatter plot. Now, the only thing that is added then is the image that comes in as the background uh, that effectively allows you to see the scatter plot on top of um, a court. Awesome, thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Um, and so we actually, um, had somebody, Kevin, say the eLearning Advanced has a great section on this very matter, just not using sports data. So thank you so much for that, Kevin. Um, we also had a request for you to demonstrate the image technique. <laughs> Is that on your blog as well? Uh, yeah, I can certainly, um, I'll, I'll tweet out a link to that blog. It, it, in this case, it's using um, a football pitch, but it is uh, exactly the same technique. You just um, sub in the image of the football pitch for the basketball pitch. And um, so each of these, before, before you even get started, you'll, you'll have the um, extremes of the, the coordinates. So let's say that uh, the side of the pitch runs from zero to 100 and the, length, the width of the pitch goes from zero to 80. So you, you know that that exists. And then based on that information, you can then uh, say, if we've got coordinates uh, 50, 50, that's gonna be somewhere in the middle of the pitch and so on. Okay, um, and then I think one last question, unless another one comes in, is what is your favorite project so far? I'm gonna take this first, Vince. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, the, I mean, seeing the things that people are putting together with this month's data is, is pretty spectacular. Um, so this, I, maybe I have some recency bias on this month as well. So um, one previous to this, though, we had uh, Jacob Olsufka provide every single pitch from Major League Baseball for, I forget how many years it was, but it was a long time. And that was really cool as well, being able to do sort of the same thing, plot out X, Y on the pitch that were uh, pitched by pitchers and then um, hits by batters and where those landed and stuff. So that was that one really uh, sticks out to me. Uh, I think I think for me it's um, the thing that I always turn to when there's a new product release or the thing that I use to, to learn new features and try new things is, is my Formula One data set which um, has information on, on every race and every driver since uh, the sport began in, in 1950. So uh, that's my kind of go-to, um, and it helps 
being really familiar with the data set because you, you don't have to worry about trying to explore new fields uh, or so on. It, it's always the same. It's just you're trying to do different things with it every time. So um, having a data set like that from the, the day that you start learning right up until the present when you think you, you know everything and then all of a sudden there's a whole new load of things that you've got to learn, um, that, that's been really useful. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing your um, your information with us today. And I think you have motivated a lot of people to dive in not only to sports data, but to also just data that excites them. Because I think that that's really what helps us um, improve and really refine our um, our expertise by getting into data that we love to play with. So thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Of course. All right. So um, we are at the end, almost at the end of today's session. I just want to make you aware of a couple of things. Let me just see. Our next event is going to be um, mid-July. So stay tuned for um, details on that. If you are interested in speaking, please apply. We look for great topics that appeal to just a, a large audience in Tableau. Um, so we are always looking for speakers who can really speak to uh, something that would be of interest to a variety and to a multitude of users. Um, so that's one of the things that we look for. And we like to have different perspectives uh, when we have presenters. So I encourage those who are interested to apply. Um, and so beyond that, then we also have uh, just wanted to make a little note that Tableau Live is going to be happening June 30th. It's based in the Europe um, time frame or time zone in um, the uh, London British summertime. Uh, time zone. And so that's happening June 30th. Um, you can go to tableau.com to register uh, for Tableau Live. So that's going to be a day long event. And that should have some amazing speakers um, and really just good information there as well. So thank you so much for attending today. Um, while, you know, the organizers really appreciate all of the questions, I'd have to track the data on this, but this session may have had the most questions ever. So that's really exciting for us. So thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. And with that, we'll close it out and have a great day. <laughs>